Excellent. Thank you for those that have joined. We'll just give it another moment and we'll get this session started. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Sue Carpenter. I'm the Director of Operations at Crypto UK, and we're delighted to have so many of you join us on the call today, and apologies for the reschedule of this event. Um, we are presenting this webinar in collaboration with CFAS, um, talking about collaborating to fight fraud and financial crime in the crypto sector. We're delighted today to be joined by the team at CFAS. So we have Simon Ridge and Amber Burridge. And we also have a guest speaker, Claire Maye from Zigloo, who will be talking through some of her experiences of working with CFAS as well. Um, just in terms of housekeeping, this session is being recorded and we will circulate a copy of this recording after the event. In addition, if anybody has any questions as we go through the session, please feel free to drop them into the question and answer section on the uh, Zoom chat on the bar at the bottom of the screen. We'll allow some time at the end of the session and we're more than happy to go through and facilitate any questions that come through. Without further ado, I will hand over to Simon to get the session started. Thank you, Sue. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Simon Ridge. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing at CIFAS. I'd just like to say thanks to Sue and Crypto UK for giving us this opportunity to speak to you all today. Special thanks to Claire from Zigloo for joining us to share her knowledge and experience of using CIFAS in her role. So for those of you that don't know CIFAS, um, this year is actually our 35th anniversary. We are a not-for-profit membership organisation that brings together different sectors for the common goal of eliminating fraud and financial crime. Over 660 organisations uh, work with us, collaborating to share data and intelligence and the learning, using our cutting edge technology to detect and prevent fraud, making it harder for criminals to operate. Each year, hundreds of thousands of records of fraudulent conduct are identified and shared across our platform. On average, a new risk case is identified and recorded to the National Fraud Database every 90 seconds. Meaning on average, our membership organizations collectively save over one billion pounds in prevented losses every year. So these are just a few examples of our current members. It covers both public and private sector. And every year we release our Fraudscape report. And uh, just last month, we released our 2022 report. And before I finish, just wanted to share a couple of key highlights that I thought were, were key for this afternoon. So in 2022, there were over 409,000 cases of fraudulent activity recorded to the National Fraud Database, the highest volume of which was actually cases of ID fraud at 277,000. That's up nearly a quarter year on year at 23%. There was also a large growth in misuse of facility at 70,000 cases, with 68% of these cases on bank accounts, which have uh, I, intelligence indicative of money mule activity. So uh, that was just a brief introduction to CIFAS and our membership. Enough of me, I'm going to hand over to Amber, who's going to talk a little bit more about CIFAS and how we work with our members. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for that, Simon. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Amber Burridge, Head of Fraud Intelligence here at CIFAS. Now, I know it's been a very busy time uh, for, for crypto sector, particularly when we've got the markets in crypto assets, regulation being passed in Europe in the past couple of weeks, but also we've got the financial services and markets bill, which is also kind of gaining momentum in terms of passing royal assent in. And that will obviously influence, influence what we want to do in terms of regulation in the crypto sector. Now, I think for me today, I wanted to give you a bit of an overview around the type of fraud that we see within the crypto sector, um, particularly as I think it's really important that as we look at what we see from a money laundering perspective, actually, we understand the whole journey in terms of fraud, potentially as that prestigate offence, but also what we're seeing in terms of what that then goes to fund afterwards. So as mentioned, in terms of some of the key things that we're seeing within the crypto sector, so misuse of facility is the main case type that we see in terms of cases recorded to us for fraudulent 
conduct. Now, what's really interesting is when we look at the filing reasons. So 92% of those are recorded in relation to fraudulent faster payment transactions. And what we actually know is that in general, across our membership, this type of filing reason has gone up by 26%. And, and we've really seen this in terms of potentially as a knock-on effect in terms of what we're seeing from the economic climate at the moment. What we do know is that a large proportion of those subjects are aged between 21 and 25. And what's interesting as well is actually when we look at, in general, as Simon alluded to, the, the volume that we see in relation to intelligence that indicates mule behaviour is a real pressing issue for financial services. So it's really important that actually financial services work more cross-sector to holistically tackle that mule problem. We also have false application. So about 40% of the cases recorded by the sector in the past year, so we're talking about 2022 figures here. Now, the bulk of them are in relation to false documents, as you can see there, and we are seeing particularly in relation to identity documents being manipulated, perhaps to change the date of birth, for instance, on, on some of those documents, and utility bills as well. And we've really seen this uptick across all of our sectors in the past year of utility bills essentially being utilised for false application. And this is particularly where we're trying to prove, for instance, proof of address. Um, so it's a real growing problem that we're seeing, particularly as there are so many really good novelty and I'll put that in quotes document sites out there that enable you to have a false utility bill because of course everybody needs one when they're going to a fancy dress party why wouldn't you when we have a look um effectively this is primarily sort of between those 21 and 25 um, and obviously we do know that on different platforms there are kind of age restrictions most you have to be at least 18 obviously in able to utilize some of the products and services but 13% are aged under 21, and this is effectively perhaps where they're trying to get around some of those age verifications uh, that organisations are attempting to do. Now, identity fraud is quite an interesting one as well uh, in terms of what we see. You know, we've seen an unprecedented volume of identity fraud cases recorded in 2022 because there is such a wealth of information out there on individuals and the way we interact with different services. There is a huge dig digital footprint now. That tied in with synthetic identities is such a growing issue that we are seeing. The, the number of false identities that were recorded to us on the database last year actually increased significantly. And we're really starting to see these synthetic identities being utilized and setting a bit of a profile to then apply for products and services. Now, when we have a look at what we're seeing within the crypto sector, the large bulk of them are in relation to false documents. So particularly where we've got a same face appearing with multiple different identities. And I've got a great example that I can show you today, but also where we're seeing manipulation of some of those true identity products, such as driving licenses, passports. And what we are seeing is the applicant within the role are primarily in aged over 30 years old bracket. I've got some intelligence here for you. I'm not gonna read through every one of them, um, but I think one thing that we know that as a sector and as, as financial institutions are aware of is obviously scam activity is rife, uh, particularly at the moment with the economy going the way that it is. People are looking for alternatives in terms of how they invest their money. You know, at least 22% of UK adults now have some kind of crypto asset and they are looking towards more digital and crypto assets going forward. I mean, I think today the Bank of England actually announced an increase in rates on mortgages. And so People are turning to alternatives now. I just wanted to draw your attention to the first example that we've got there of, of individuals that are responding to some of these adverts on social media. And then the threat actor poses as their account manager and effectively gets them to share their computer screen via AnyDesk is kind of one of the typical pieces of software used to talk through the process in terms of setting up wallets and making those transactions. But actually what's happening is that threat actor is then obtaining that personal and financial information. And when they show them that they set up a wallet for them, actually the wallet is not in the customer's name. They also have access to their seed phrase as well. I've spoken to a victim myself in the past couple of weeks and the, the tactics that are used by some of these individuals is it starts off in terms of great opportunity. They'll, you'll invest a small amount and then you'll get 
50% back on your investment. So they encourage you to invest more. And in some circumstances, are encouraged to take out loans to then fund that. What I then saw when looking at the wallets was actually the transaction that came out of this victim's wallet went into another one, which had received multiple transactions from various wallets and they were all cashed out. There is nothing in that wallet now. And so we are really starting to see these mule networks, particularly where we're going, going from a, a kind of traditional banking perspective, moving more towards digital forms of payment and transactions. The other one I wanted to mention um, is particularly around the use of social media in terms of Twitter as well. So we see it quite a lot in financial services and potentially a lot of you on today's call will have a background in financial services where we do see threat actors sitting on Twitter handles. And so if you then make a tweet to your organization, to your institution, oh, I'm having a problem with my accounts, these threat actors will then jump on that tweet and then take the conversation to a different platform to talk through what your issues are, but then gain access to your account. Obviously, ChatGPT has grown phenomenally. Deep fake technology has grown by 900% in the past year as well. And we know it is a real challenge for organizations at the moment where they are having their brand spoof and also where they are having their, their sort of digital ways of communicating with customers being targeted as key threat vendors, but it's something that we need to work collaboratively with in terms of understanding what that threat looks like. So an example I've just mentioned about spoofed uh, brands. Um, the victim I was speaking to this week, actually, when they guided me through the website that they've been lured to, it, it, it does very much mimic a genuine firm. And I think what we know is that Criminals will target organizations that aren't part of, say, Crypto UK, but also CIFAS. They will target those organizations that aren't part of those collective membership organizations. So I've got an example here. Um, apologies to anybody that may be on SwissBorg on the call today. However, what's really interesting is, as a, as a member of the public, in terms of trying to identify whether or not you're actually on a spoof website is really difficult. I think the key thing that we can see here is that we've got this re register now and receive a 20% bonus. Um, so actually, it's kind of really interesting that it's, it's doing that incentive incentivization piece, which is not what crypto firms would do. But then also, we've got this chat function at the bottom as well, which is not on the genuine website. And what I can tell you is that this was actually registered uh, in November 2022. Very similar URL, and if you think about it, if you're screening on your phone, it's really difficult actually to really check what URL you're really looking at. And of course, social media is a kind of key enabler for some of the frauds that we see within the crypto space. So I just wanted to talk you through a journey here in terms of what we're seeing. So if we work from left to right to the screen, so on the left, um, we've got potential recruitment. So sort of in terms of actually we can, you can act as a kind of crypto advisor and you can help move money around. But then also we've got an example here in the middle of an individual who's actually had their money taken out of their account through some kind of illegitimate activity. And then they're being directed to pay it out essentially in this video. They're being guided on how they can then use that to move it out. And obviously we do see here examples of oh, actually, if you go through Trust Wallet, you don't do this. And actually, if you um, use, obviously, there are various services out there that allow you to tumble, to, to hide, or at least try and change the origin of where that funding has come from. So we do see that. Uh, and that is becoming a bit more prevalent, particularly where we're seeing where these funds are moving around from a fraud perspective into the money laundering space. And here is a key example of something that I want to show you today. So we've got an example here of a network uh, that we've seen, and this is a mule network. So if we start off with individual A, um, they were recorded in April to the National Fraud Database by a fintech, but also by a traditional uh, banking organization, effectively for cases that are indicative of money mule behavior. You'll see in the middle, there is an address that has been highlighted uh, and effectively this address then links to individual B who has also been recorded against a FinTech for a case that has intelligence indicative of money mulding behavior. Same with individual D, they are also linked by that address once again for 
um, misuse of facility. And this is for a case where intelligence is indicative of money mule behavior. And then when we actually have a look, it's not just the address that is connecting some of these individuals. So actually we've got individual E there that is connected by telephone number and also by the email address. And what I want to draw your attention to here is actually individual C was then recorded in August 2022 for misuse on a crypto product. And eventually it was for faster, fraudulent faster payments. So understanding where you sit in that journey is really important. And be, being able to share that data means that actually you can help prevent and detect fraud and financial crime in a more efficient way. So identity fraud, verification in digital world. Yes, I know it looks like a spider has just crawled all over my screen, but I've got a network here that I wanted to demonstrate to you today because the key commonality within this network is the document that we have. We have addresses, as you can see, they're highlighted. We also have some contact details, which have also been highlighted, but it is this document that is the key common factor within all of these cases. And as you can see here, I have some interesting um, screenshots of a wonderful chap who effectively has been targeting a number of organizations for identity fraud. Now at SciFAS, we have facial matching and effectively these cases have been matched purely by that base and that software that we have. So you can see we've got individual kind of used on an application with a FinTech member back in November into 2021. And then they kind of move on a little bit later. So they give it some time. And then that same face from a selfie then crops up uh, in May 2022, once again, for a product with a fintech member. It's not just selfies that it captures. It also scans it across any identity documents that we have um, on the database. So we have over 20,000 identity documents that are with faces that you can search and match on on the database. And what we can see here is that this face, I mean, this um, driving license that's being used in, in, on the 2nd of the 8th, to me, it look, you can see that that face, that image has been photoshopped or it has been manipulated with some type of software because in the picture next to it, the individual has like a goatee and a beard and where they've tried to take that out, you can see it's slightly cut off parts of their face. So it's definitely been manipulated, but we can see that this face then appears on a document that was then used to apply for a crypto wallet with a member. And then again, that crypto member has then helped another member detect fraud by uploading their false document because then we've got a traditional banking member has also matched on that document. All the details are different. It is purely that face that has linked those cases. And so that was a bit of a whistle stop tour in terms of some of the things that we've definitely been seeing, but you'd really wanna hear from someone who actually utilizes the system rather than myself. So I'm really, excited to introduce Claire from Zigloo today to give her insights in terms of how her organization uses um, SciFast, but also a big thank you to Claire as well for giving her insights today. Absolutely no problem. Thank you for having me, guys. Hi, everyone. I'm Claire and I'm the Director of Financial Crime Operations at Zigloo. Um, and I'm also a, 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 a PhD researcher at the University of Portsmouth as well. Um, a, 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 a uh, thank you uh, um, to Sue and, and to Cyphas for having me um, today. Um, as Amber said, I'm, I'm going to give you a brief overview as to how uh, 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 Zigloo uh, uses uh, 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 um, Cyphas to help um, prevent fraud and financial crime. Um, so in my in my team, which is in the first line of and defence that oversees the onboarding and ongoing monitoring teams, as well as and quality control, and we use a uh, CIFAS both in the onboarding stage and in the ongoing monitoring as well. So uh, with regards to the onboarding side, we use uh, um, SciFAS um, in the onboarding um, funnel. Um, we use it at the very end of the funnel. Um, we have. Uh, uh, other various checks uh, 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 and beforehand in the um, application journey. Um, we mainly see, uh, 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 based on experience at Zigloo, um, we mainly see um, false um, documentation. We see a lot of those. Um, forged um, passports and um, driving licenses are the main ones that we've seen. Um, we've also seen a lot of people who have tried um, to 
uh, and perpetrate application fraud in other fintechs and then they come to us um so that's sort of how we've how we've uh, 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 used a uh, cyfas um in the onboarding side of things um with regards to ongoing monitoring, um, we we do a batch um, screening every so often. Um, at the moment, it's every quarter. Um, so we will screen our um, customer book um, to see if anyone has been filed to CIFAS since they were onboarded. Um, if we didn't do this, we essentially run the risk of all of our customers having passed the uh, CIFAS check at onboarding. And then they could go on and perpetrate fraud elsewhere and we wouldn't know about it. So that's why we, we always want to have that ongoing check just to um, remove anyone from the uh, uh, um, customer base who has been proven to have perpetrated fraud elsewhere as they would therefore fall outside of our uh, risk appetite. Um, Amber also mentioned the um, facial recognition um piece on the nfd that has been a lifesaver for us um we are i'm currently doing our uh, 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 um, kyc uh, refresh and edd checks um so asking our um customers to resubmit their updated details and to submit um a form of identity which has a photograph on it um and so the uh, uh, facial recognition side has been really really beneficial on that front with regards to trends that we're seeing um especially in the um, crypto side um money muling i'm sure you'll all be absolutely thrilled to hear is still on the up especially as far as as Ziglu is um concerned um we also find that there are lots of ways that um, criminals will try to um, bypass our checks and our um, transaction um, monitoring rules. Most uh, 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 notably, they will um, uh, uh, essentially trade for uh, um, crypto and then uh, sell it on, but they won't care if they make a profit or not because they just want to hide funds and to clean it through our um, accounts. So normally people want to invest in um, crypto to make um, money, um, but actually they will just um, invest in crypto and then a few minutes later they'll just take it out again because they don't care if they make a loss or not, they just want to clean the funds or to attempt to unclean them and integrate them within the um, financial system. Um, another one, again, I'm just uh, 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 repeating Amber uh, 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 at this stage, basically, um, but scams um, are one that we're absolutely seeing. Um, not necessarily seeing a seasonal trend with this one, it just happens all the time. Um, we see a lot of customers who fall um, victim to uh, uh, um, Facebook purchases mainly, um, so on a Facebook um, marketplace and um, for example they will pay for a a, a, a product um, and then they will actually be asked to pay in um, uh, um, crypto instead of um, uh, 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 um, fiat and um, currency um, at some stages the customer does get uh, uh, suspicious um, but on the other hand there are other fraudsters who will say oh you know um, with the new um, regulation coming in and um, it's absolutely trusted and you haven't got to worry so they're trying to sort of sponge off the um, developments on the new uh, legislation uh, surrounding crypto um, to try to persuade victims that it's all absolutely legitimate and that sort of speaks to the wider crypto culture as a whole I feel because um, I think that all products and services have a risk attached to them, but I think that the reputation of crypto in, in particular is um, particularly um, negative and um, just because you can't physically hold it and you can't touch it. And as soon as people sort of start to understand that you actually can't see it and you can't touch it and it isn't necessarily uh, regulated, it kind of generates a fear around that too. Um, another thing that we're working on alongside all of the regulatory changes um, is the consumer duty of care, which um, the FCA has um, implemented and is due to go live this summer. 
Um, on a final note, really, from how we use uh, SciFast at uh, Ziglu um, is to submit intelligence to SciFast to help generate their um, be aware alerts, which are um, disseminated as um, uh, uh, um, trends to the SciFast um, uh, membership as well. Uh, so one thing that I always try to push my team to do is if they spot any trends, then to get in touch with a, a, a SciFast to um, help inform them of the trends that we're seeing so that hopefully they can also share that with other members and to also help them in uh, tackling um, financial crime as well. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Claire. Okay. Um, and Amber and Simon as well. Um, just to reiterate to anybody on the call, if you have any questions, please do put them into the Q&A uh, section on Zoom. Um, there's a couple that I've got ready to go, but Amber, Simon, was there anything else you wanted to add after Claire's session? I think just to tie on what Claire was saying, you know, we've, we've had really good proactive response actually from, from the intelligence that her organisation have submitted where actually it's actually helped a number of financial organisations as well to detect further fraud off the back of that and um, sharing kind of examples of some of the documentation, for instance, and even where they've got utility bills, which have got a particular amount actually are tied to them. It's actually helped the financial community as a whole and actually kind of that feedback as well, because, for instance, Ziglu might have seen one part of the jigsaw, but then you've got another organisation that's seen the other bit. So kind of having that real holistic view of what that fraud threat really looks like it's really important when you're trying to act agilely in this environment. So thank you to, to Ziggly for their contributions because it has helped the wider community. Yeah, um, thank you from me. Thanks, Claire. That's great. Thank you. Just um, a couple of questions then. Um, Claire, quite interestingly, you talked about the fact that after sort of post onboarding, you do go through the process of then screening your whole client book just to mm. see if there are any issues that have occurred post onboarding for any of your um, clients as well. What sort of percentage have you seen since you've started using this process of uh, people that have made it through your onboarding process where you've then had to take a decision to offboard? Um, we've seen about, I'm just trying to work out the maths, which is going to be problematic. Um, we're probably on about five to 10% of our um, customer book, which it's quite scary, really, um, because I think that uh, 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 and people sort of often um, uh, uh, um, mistake their uh, uh, um, fraud checks to sort of all be at the onboarding stage. And once they're in, it's absolutely fine and they are going to commit a crime at, uh, 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 at all. Um, we've done our um, initial checks and now that they're through the door, it's all good. Um, but I think I think that some uh, 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 um, fraudsters will often um, forget that ongoing screening is a thing, really, because I think that they feel that the onboarding journey is just sort of the um, main hurdle that they have to bypass. Um, so for us, absolutely making sure that, you know, if someone is able to um, get through the onboarding journey and uh, uh, and they have been uh, uh, and filed and um, uh, uh, for fraud by another CIFAS member then we absolutely will take action on that obviously it undergoes a, a manual um, review um, because we have um, uh, 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 and protective um, registrations and victim cases too um, but it's absolutely something that we need to make sure we uh, and continuously um, do because you know we, uh, we've had up to you know uh, uh, and between um, five to ten um, percent of our um, customer book has actually perpetrated fraud after onboarding um, and it's it's quite shocking really um, so I would, I'd absolutely encourage uh, 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 other CIFAS um, members to ensure that they're basically making the most of CIFAS um, I think that most people see it as an onboarding tool but it's absolutely much more than that fabulous thank you claire and um, we've had another question come through a really interesting one here saying is it reasonable to assume that the trend for investment fraud is that trust is built up between the scammer and the victim and the amounts are built up over time in size and from your experience claire from the first transaction to the biggest transaction mm. does it look like days or weeks does or does it sometimes get to months 
it's always days. It's always very, very quick, especially in uh, I'm Ziglu. Uh, I can't speak for um, uh, uh, other fintechs or other uh, um, crypto uh, um, companies, but for us, it's always very, very quick. We we don't have uh, 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 um, customers who sort of do bits at a time. It's always the large sums of money in one go, um, which in a way sort of means that we don't have the sleeper typology um, in a way, but then on the negative side, it also means that it just happens so damn quickly. Um, so I think for, for us, it's just being able to make sure that we're always on the ball and trying to be one step ahead. Um, and like I mentioned um, earlier with uh, 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 um, fraudsters just trying to um, invest um, money and and take it out within um, uh, uh, minutes of doing so you know it's really really quick um i've not yet come across uh, um, customers who will leave it in their account for uh, long periods of time um i don't know if that's just because of the opportunistic uh, 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 um, concept of it or if it's because they themselves are under time pressure i don't know but that's just what we've seen excellent thank you claire um Amber, Simon, probably an interesting question for you guys to answer. I mean, we've obviously talked about the sort of that two-way flow of information that, you know, the work that CFAS does is only supported by the level of information that you receive in. How critical is it for you to get that level of information and how can crypto firms work with you or provide that level of information to help you build out that network as well? I was going to say, yeah, I'll, I'll probably be best place to take this one in all fairness. Yeah. So I think one of the things obviously that we capture is we do capture device IDs, IP addresses, as well as the, the bank account information, the information about the individual. And I think it is important because at the moment, as, as Claire alluded to, there is particularly from a financial institution perspective, they talk about crypto and crypto being used for cash out. But actually, in terms of understanding what that cash out looks like is is really difficult. So I think that's kind of from a more collaborative approach. I think it, it's one of those things where, for instance, for you, in terms of when you're onboarding and when you're monitoring customers, you'll understand, actually, have I got a good customer on my book? Because as Claire said, you know, they might look great at onboarding stage, but circumstances change things happen and actually what what kind of Claire's organization are, are detecting is that you've actually got individuals recorded by not just financial institutions but it might also be insurers online retailers and then that helps you make that risk-based approach in terms of do I still want this customer if I do still want this customer actually what what can I then put in place to monitor what they're doing and, and how they're doing it and actually, on the offset as well, that helps inform the picture from, from a fraud perspective for other sectors in terms of if you can then come along and say, actually, yes, we've identified, we've had identity fraud occur on, on this account. And actually, we know that somebody's been impersonated. You're protecting a victim. So one thing that sort of Simon said about the, the 277,000 cases, that's 277,000 victims that have been protected in one year. So actually, that looks quite, in terms of, yes, you're hitting your regulatory obligations, but also you're hitting your safeguarding obligations as well by protecting your customers and also by protecting your greater customer book. That then actually means that in terms of what you're doing from not only a, from those regulatory obligations, but from a reputational perspective, actually, you are a really good organization. And that also helps in terms of customers feeling that they can actually bank with you, they can trust what you're doing, they can hand over their details to you. So it does definitely work in both ways. And I suppose just the other side of that is how can crypto organizations and the members that we represent at Crypto UK get more involved both in supporting that free flow of information into CIFAS, but also utilizing the services that you have available? So it's a membership organization. So uh, they can get in contact with us. We can get them to a little bit more about what they're looking to achieve and how we can support them. And then we can discuss membership in, with them in more detail. But we, we often like these events, it's, it's more around raising that awareness as far as I'm concerned. So if we can build that relationship up over time, 
they see the value of SciFast, and I'd like to think they'd love, like to become a member. So it's not not a director of sales. It's not all about that. It's actually really just a raising awareness of SciFast at this point in time, so people can actually see the value of what we do. And for me, just reiterating what Amber says, I think the the real value is the cross sector collaboration, and that and what that how we can drive that, and how we can share that data, and that's the real value of what SciFast and the platform can deliver for our members and organisations that join us. So, yeah. More than happy people to get in contact, and we can try and help and support them a little bit more. Fantastic. There's no more questions that have come through. So, um, Amber, Simon, was there anything else you wanted to do just to wrap up this session? Uh, no, just thank you very much, Sue, for giving us this opportunity. It's great. Um, and uh, like I say earlier, thank you to Claire for joining us and sharing uh, your uh, knowledge and experience. Thank you very much. Fantastic. And thank you all, um, Amber, Simon, Claire, for taking the time today to go through this. And thank you to our members that have participated. As Simon said, if you want any more information, you can obviously contact them via the website. But if not, you can feel free to get in touch with ourselves at Crypto UK and we can direct you to the team at SciFest as well. Claire, thank you for sharing those examples. I think they really helped bring them to life for the, uh, the members that are on the call as well. Um, and thank you for everybody for re-attending this session. And we managed to get through it this time. So. <laughs> Huge achievement, but thanks guys. And we will make the recording of this session available afterwards as well. Thanks Absolutely. a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.